Hey, where is everyone? It's 9 o'clock. Class is supposed to start. So, uh, just joking. You know that the uh, class was canceled this morning. And uh, we are going to stick with the schedule and we're going to have a group discussion next time. So I'm posting this uh, video review of Chapter 11 for you. When you log into Blackboard, you'll see the video. Uh, you'll also see an uh, announcement that I posted last week about your grades for Quiz 1. Uh, you can go into the grades area, click on your score twice to see the correct answers. Uh, also, as I mentioned, the group discussion is over Chapter 11, and uh, we're going to have some time at the beginning of class to work on that. Uh, but I do need you to look at the group discussion questions, uh, and based on what we cover in the review, answer them individually so you can come to class ready to discuss them as a group. And I'm just going to go through the slides for chapter 11 here. And we are transitioning out of uh, intellectual property and internet law to a discussion of the Uniform Commercial Code and contracts for the sale of goods, contracts for the lease of goods. Uh, this is the foundational chapter where we take a look at how these contracts are formed uh, and the concepts of title and risk. And uh, while it's not required that you take BA 207 before this, it is a good idea to have kind of an understanding of contract law and the common law uh, before this. Um, I'll try to mention some of the differences between the UCC and common law as we go along. But we're talking about Article 2, which covers contracts for the sale of goods, and Article 2A, which covers contracts for the lease of goods. Uh, we'll take a look at some uh, terms that the UCC defines and some exceptions uh, created by the UCC uh, that relate to the statute of frauds. We're also going to take a look at uh, the risk of loss and the fact that it doesn't necessarily pass at the same time title to the goods pass. And we'll also take a look at um, what law governs contracts and the contracts for the sale of goods. So, the UCC. Article 2 and 2A covers the sale and lease of goods. Uh, and you can see these other articles, and some of these we will address in, in other chapters in Business Law too. Uh, we will talk about negotiable instruments and banking. We'll talk about uh, securities um, and secured transactions in Article 9. But we're primarily focused today on uh, Article 2 and 2A. And you can kind of see through this uh, slide here that um, contracts that don't involve the sale of goods are governed by uh, general contract law, primarily the common law, and then the UCC governs contracts for the sale of goods, except in areas where the UCC is silent, and then we look to the common law or case law. Uh, so we look at uh, how previous cases were cited just involving contracts. So some of the terms we have to define here. Um, a sale is the passing of title from the seller to the buyer for a price. And goods are tangible and movable. So we are talking about personal property and things that we can uh, touch, move. Uh, we're not talking about land or services or intangible things like stocks. Uh, one of the issues that comes up uh, is when a contract involves goods and services or a contract where it's difficult to tell when it is a contract for a good or service. For example, you go to eat in a restaurant, is it primarily service or is it primarily the purchase of food? So we'll take a look at that. Uh, basically, the general rule is that if it's predominantly a contract for the sale of goods, then the UCC controls the whole contract and vice versa. If it's contract for the sale of services primarily, then the UCC would not control the contract. What's a merchant? So merchant is defined in Article 2. Uh, it says that um, a merchant is somebody who holds themselves out to be a merchant or somebody who regularly deals in those type of go um, goods or, or has special skills uh, in that um, or even someone who employs someone. So a uh, clerk at um, a major retail outlet is considered an, an agent and also considered a uh, merchant for purposes of the UCC. 
So Article 2A uh, covers leases. This is a lease agreement between a lesser and lessee for goods. And as it says there at the bottom, it's uh, all commercial consumer leases or financing of goods. And a lot of the provisions of 2A look just like 2, so we'll primarily just focus on Article 2 and then talk about some of the differences when we get to those. So as I mentioned earlier, the UCC modifies the common law of contracts. Uh, so if it's a contract for the sale of goods, it preempts the common law, but where the USCC is silent, then the common law would govern. And there are some differences. Uh, notice in the case of an offer, under the common law, it had to be very specific, include all the terms so that the other party knew what to accept. Uh, under the UCC, it's a valid offer, even if it includes open or missing terms. So, for example, it could include um, most of the terms but be missing the price. And as long as there is a way to determine the price, uh, for example, uh, in the bullet it says the court will determine a reasonable price of delivery and enforce the contract if there isn't a price or perhaps the price is going to be set later for example maybe it's dependent upon market conditions at the time or it could be open payment so the parties don't necessarily agree on what the payment terms is notice that it says under the UCC payment is due at the time and place at which the buyer is to receive the goods unless and this is the same with all these terms unless the contract says something differently. Parties are free to enter into any kind of contract that's lawful even if it's uh, different than what the UCC is. The UCC can be kind of as a default when um, the parties don't necessarily address one of these open terms. Uh, open delivery. Notice this is the buyer takes delivery at the seller's place of business which may seem a little weird because when you think about delivery you think about goods moving somewhere but in this case the um, goods are, I mean if you think about do you typically get something shipped from Walmart uh, to you? No, typically you go to the store and you buy it. You know, you could buy it online, but basically we would consider without anything in the contract about it that if um, there's delivery, it means the buyer comes in and gets it by default. Of course, the parties could agree to something different. Quantity is the tricky one. If we don't have anything about quantity, then it, it's difficult to determine um, the terms of the contract and then there is no contract. Now there are some exceptions to that. Uh, there's requirement contracts and output contracts. A requirement contract would say the buyer has agreed to purchase all he needs from the seller. So in other words the buyer would get all that they need to do their work uh, through the seller and not through someone else. So that would make it definite enough. Also with an output contract that the buyer agrees to purchase all that the uh, seller produces. So even though the quantity isn't specified, 100 of this, 10 of that, um, if it's a requirement or outputs contract, that would be sufficient. Another thing you saw in the common law was um, a offer that was to remain open. In other words, a revo uh, an irrevocable offer uh, had to be supported by consideration uh, under the uh, UCC, there uh, is what's called a merchant's firm offer. So, you notice the bottom bullet here. It says there's um, the idea that, um, well, actually the two bullets, the first one, the idea that there could be an option contract where the offeree pays consideration for um, the offer remaining open for a specific period of time. Uh, under the UCC, there's a second exception where if it's a merchant and it's a firm offer then it must remain open and then there's some terms to that notice in the bullet it says firm offer occurs when a merchant so it has to be a merchant offer or gives assurances in the signed writing so in other words the merchant has to sign a writing that the offer will remain open and if that's the case uh, it must remain open even if it's not supported by consideration um, Usually there's a term to that in there, but if there's not, uh, then it's for a reasonable period of time, uh, not to exceed three months. Acceptance. Uh, basically, a seller could specify the way of acceptance, but if they don't, then any reasonable means 
uh, would be acceptable. So uh, an offer is made in a letter, the acceptance made by phone or email or fax, whatever the case might be. Unless the seller says it can't be accepted that way, that would be fine. Uh, even a promise to ship or promptly shipping uh, conforming is good is considered uh, an acceptance. Notice the last bullet here, non-conforming goods. A prompt shipment of non-conforming goods is both an acceptance, yes, I want to accept your offer, and a breach because the, the goods are non-conforming. Uh, that's true unless the seller notifies the goods that they're an accommodation. So the seller uh, ships something that is not what the buyer asked for, but with it indicates that it isn't and that it's simply an accommodation. Uh, notice the last sentence there. Notice the accommodation must indicate no contract has been formed. So in other words, here I'm shipping to these using your accommodation. This isn't a contract for these goods. That's what would be required in the UCC. Otherwise, a shipment of non-conforming goods would be considered uh, both an acceptance and a breach. Additional terms. Under the common law, the terms need to be the same. In other words, if someone makes an offer, the acceptance has to mirror that offer. However, in the UCC, uh, in a lot of these provisions under the UCC, it's a little more flexible. And if a um, Offeree accepts the terms, but then adds in additional terms. There's some rules around what is the, you know, the final contract. So it depends upon the status of the um, parties. Notice if either one of them is a non-merchant, in other words, both are non-merchants, or one's a merchant, the other one's a non-merchant, then only original terms are part of the agreement. In other words, there's an offer and an acceptance with additional terms. There is a contract, it includes all the common terms, and then we have these uh, additional terms that are not part of that agreement. If they're both merchants, then notice the additional terms do become part of the contract. So an offer is made, it doesn't address a shipment, the, um, the offeree accepts and, and specifies how they expect shipment to take place. Uh, those, if both parties are merchants, would become part of the contract unless, and there are several exceptions to it, one is that the offeror indicated that there couldn't be any additional terms. The second one would be that the additional terms materially alter the contract. For example, I accept, but I want to pay half of that. Uh, or the parties object. So, in other words, the offeror makes an offer, the offeree accepts with additional terms, and then within a reasonable period of time, the original offer or rejects those additional terms. Otherwise, they become part of the agreement if they're both merchants. Consideration. Um, you know, we knew that was a element of the contract under common law. It continues to be under the UCC. Now, under the common law, if you wanted to modify a contract, you basically had to pay for it or, or give something else of value, consideration. In other words, if you changed or added to uh, some kind of contract, you need to show proof that both parties agreed for that additional um, agreement. But under the UCC, uh, there can be modifications to the original agreement if, um, even if there's no consideration, uh, if there is a writing that evidences that both parties uh, agreed to that change. So notice the bullets. If the contract itself prohibits changes without a writing, then it needs to be in writing. If the consumer is dealing with a merchant who supplies non-oral modification form, the consumer must sign a separate acknowledgement. And any modification that brings the contract under the UCC statute of frauds. In other words, you can see that example in your book where they agree to something that's less than the statute of frauds, maybe $300 versus $500, and then the modification takes it over, then that should be uh, in writing. Uh, but other than those three bullets, it could technically be uh, a modification that's not in writing uh, and not supported by additional consideration, um, but not it's not that way under the common law. All right, statute of frauds doesn't go away with the UCC. Contracts for the sale of goods over $500 or leases over $1,000 need to be in writing to be enforceable. Uh, there are some special rules, again, for merchants remembering back to what we said a merchant was. And 
that could perhaps be a phone call follow up with a written memorandum or confirmation uh, the evidence is the oral agreement um, typically what we're looking for is that to be that writing whatever it is to be signed by the party who we're attempting to enforce the contract against and there are some exceptions um, if, if if a good is made different or custom or spe it's specially manufactured then that's probably evidence that somebody asked for it that way uh, admissions if somebody were to admit in court that there was a contract then it's difficult to argue that there isn't one and then partial performance you know if the one party ships the good and the other party pays part of the contract then that's evidence that there is a contract even though it's not in writing so this um, exhibit is in your chapter and I think it's a good way of laying out what we've talked about up to this point and uh, taking a look at the difference between contract law and sales law and what we're talking about here is contracts for the sale of goods uh, looking at the terms of the contract what constitute an acceptance when a contract can be modified supported by consideration or not when an offer can be revocable and what are the statute of fraud requirements so uh, take a look at that the parole evidence rule notice this isn't parole with an E on the end of it this is uh, evidence outside the written agreement so notice it says generally terms of a written agreement or memo cannot be contradicted by prior extrinsic evidence in other words if you go into court and there is a written document that's supposed to be the contract between the parties the court doesn't want to hear oral testimony that contradicts that um, they're assuming that if the parties agreed to those terms they would have put them in the written agreement however if the oral testimony is consistent in other words it's not contradictory it, it maybe speaks to additional terms that aren't in the writing that would be allowed uh, if the testimony is about uh, course of dealing or usage of trades this is the way we do it in this industry that wasn't addressed in the contract you know basically areas where the contract might be uh, ambiguous and need oral uh, evidence to support it um, how the parties have performed in the past or oh, more like I said you know interpreting the contract so if I had a contract that said fully loaded perhaps the court would need some testimony to define uh, what the parties agreed that that means or what it typically means in the industry uh, then unconscionability we talked about that in business law one it's back again uh, really it uh, means to shock the conscience of the court and um, basically what the court would do is say yes there's a writing or may, perhaps the terms aren't equal uh, but it would be unfair or one-sided uh, to enforce the contract in that case the contract or the court could refuse to enforce the contract could separate the conscionable from the unconscionable parts um, or in the case of uh, 11.3 Jones versus Star Credit the court could say uh, well the debt's been paid we're not going to require the uh, debtor to pay more than they need to so separate that unconscionable part uh, in that case a, an elderly woman paid um, many times the value of a freezer and uh, when it went to court the court said well realizing that she did agree to it but it's unconscionable we're not going to make her continue to pay for something that she's already paid off all right next major part of chapter 11 is about title and risk of loss so the, the sale of goods require different rules than real property law because goods move around and there is uh, some risk associated with that when they are passed from seller to carrier to the buyer and the risk may not always pass with title so for example there could be some goods stored in a warehouse the question comes up who owns it at that period of time and in fact both, maybe both the seller and the buyer have some risk if something happens to the good so the common law in this area is replaced by the UCC and we have some specific uh, concepts that we're going to look here and the arrows indicate they're on the subsequent slides we're going to look at identification risk of loss and insurable interest now identification really means uh, separating out the goods so we, we produce a thousand refrigerators and we designate a, a particular batch or single refrigerator for a particular buyer so 
before title the goods can pass from the seller to the buyer they, they need to exist and be identified uh, notice that's an and so certainly they may exist they may have already been produced but once they're separated and identified as going to that particular buyer then there's a potential for title to pass and um, then we have risk if something happens to it so it says identification takes place when the specific goods are designated as the subject matter of the contract and gives the buyer the right to obtain insurance on the goods and to recover damages from a third party so this could be sitting in a warehouse this could be at the manufacturer site but the point that they're supposed to go to the buyer the buyer could suffer a loss if they don't get those goods um, if they already exist then at the bottom there it says identification takes place at the time the contract is made so those particular goods are specified for that contract there may be goods that are identified in the future. Uh, it gives an example of unborn animals or crops, and um, there are some rules in the UCC about when identification takes place there. Um, there's also some you know, issues around um, the batch creation of goods or um, goods that are fungible, which means the goods are, are difficult to identify. So if we have a silo full of wheat it's difficult to separate them out so we might define them uh, in some kind of measure so passage of title passage of title from the seller to the buyer occurs when the parties agree it does so it's not always with delivery it's not always upon identification of the goods it's when the parties agree to notice the second bullet there if there's no agreement under Article 2, Section 401, title identified good passes to the buyer at the time and place the seller physically delivers the goods. Now, there are different types of contracts in terms of delivery, and um, we're going to talk about shipment and destination contracts. If there is an agreement, passage of title to the buyer depends on whether the contract is a shipment or a destination contract. In other words, the parties could agree to something differently. A shipment contract means that title passes at the time and place of shipment. In other words, as soon as it's shipped, then title passes. Or destination, when title passes when the goods are tendered at the destination. So whatever that destination is, and it may not necessarily be at the buyer's place of business, when it gets to that destination, then the title passes the buyer. For example, maybe it's a port, maybe it's a warehouse somewhere, but at that point, then the buyer has title to the property. Uh, in fact, we can even have title transfer um, a delivery made without the goods moving. So it could sit in a warehouse and move from the seller to the buyer through a document of title for example so some document that evidences who owns it and then the actual uh, document changes hands versus actually moving the goods uh, if there's not a document as it says in the last bullet there when a sales contract is made if the goods have been identified or when the identification occurs if that hasn't been identified so in other words uh, no document of title uh, the goods are not moving than at the moment that a sales contract is made. And there's some other issues, you know. Um, if uh, somebody were to uh, steal the goods, they don't get a uh, title to the good. Uh, avoidable title, the seller has the power to transfer goods, uh, so in good faith, purchaser has a valid title. So in other words, um, a seller who uh, isn't a thief transfers uh, goods and a good faith purchaser, in other words, somebody who doesn't know about an issue with title, uh, can get valid title to the goods. And then the question is, you know, whoever is claiming title now has a contest uh, with a seller, but the good faith purchaser would get to keep uh, the goods. And, you know, an example of this, uh, this entrustment role down here at the bottom. If somebody were to take a ring in, for example, to a jeweler, uh, entrusting goods to a merchant who deals in those goods, gives them the power to transfer all rights in the ordinary course of business. So, for some reason, uh, 
somebody comes in, they look at the ring, and they buy it. Um, perhaps the clerk doesn't know that it's been entrusted to them and it's not for sale. Uh, that would be a legitimate sale. And now the um, the original person who entrusted them has a, an action against the uh, seller of those goods. Uh, so risk of loss, or what we call ROL, um, when there is movement of the goods. Uh, when a contract calls for movement of goods without agreement, when risk of loss passes, then the courts determine whether uh, it is a shipment contract or a destination contract, and we talked about that. If it's a shipment contract and the risk of loss passes when the seller tenders those goods to the carrier, in other words, if it's a shipment contract, the seller tenders the goods to the carrier, and once it gets in the hands of the carrier, the risk of loss passes to the buyer. Uh, in a in a destination contract, the risk of loss passes when the goods are tendered at a destination by that carrier. If the goods are held by a seller and there's no movement of the goods, then um, the document of title is generally not used because they're they're with the seller. Uh, if the seller is a merchant, the risk of loss passes when the buyer takes actual possession of the goods. So they typically go to the seller's place of business and pick up the goods. Uh, if the goods are held by a bailey or warehouse, not uh, with a seller, then the risk of loss passes when the buyer receives a document of title. Uh, the bailey acknowledges the buyer's right to goods and the buyer receives the title and has a reasonable time to pick them up. Uh, shipment of non-conforming goods. So this is an issue when um, we're trying to figure out who's the risk of loss and the seller has breached the contract because they shipped goods that weren't conforming to the contract. If that occurs, then the risk stays with the seller and the risk of loss doesn't pass until the buyer until the seller fixes the problem or cures the defect. Uh, and that's typically through repairing or replacing the goods. Or the buyer accepts, so even though those goods are non-conforming, they take them and they waive the right to reject. Um, notice the second bullet up here, the buyer's revocation of acceptance after the discovery of latent defects. So it's possible that a buyer might accept goods, believing that they're conforming, and then later find out uh, that they're not, and it's reasonable that they couldn't find out about that initially. Uh, the risk would actually pass back to the seller to the extent that the buyer's insurance doesn't cover the loss. Risk of loss when there is the buyer's breach. Generally the loss passes to the buyer if the buyer breaches. So you know really we can look at this you know as a general rule. If the seller breaches they have the risk of loss, the buyer breaches they have the risk of loss. There are some exceptions. It says with the following limitations uh, the good must be identified by the seller or lesser. So we need to have identified goods. The buyer bears a risk for only a commercially reasonable period of time if they breach the contract. And the buyer is liable for only the deficiency in the seller's insurance coverage. Insurable interest. We have an insurable interest in goods when we would suffer a loss. Uh, buyer uh, has that after the goods are identified. Notice the seller has an insurable interest in good as long as they retain title or a security interest. So this could be their may perhaps hands of a shipper or even with a buyer and they're retaining a security interest so they still would have some risk of loss, still could insure it. Uh, so notice at the bottom here both buyer and seller could have an insurable interest in the same goods at the same time. And then contracts for the international sale of goods or CISG. It's kind of the UCC uh, at an international level and notice the second bullet here, it says uh, applies to international sale of goods like the UCC applies to the domestic sale of goods and there are a lot of similarities between the UCC and the CISG notice the last bullet here um, there could be an irrevocable offer without a writing uh, and the acceptance are required to mirror uh, the offer in the case of the CISG. Alright, so that is a review of chapter 11 and now I want to go in to the uh, assignments area and just kind of show you the questions, the format of them, and give you some guidance as to where to look in the chapter.
And we'll take a look at this at the start of uh, class here. Uh, let me make this a little bigger here. So each group's going to uh, meet initially in the classroom after we go over the group discussion questions and have some time to come up with your group answer. And then uh, the criteria for grading your answers is in the uh, group discussion here. Uh, the first question, eDesign Inc. orders 150 computer desks. Favorite Supplies ships 150 printer stands. Is this an acceptance of an offer or a counteroffer? If it is an acceptance, is it a breach of contract? What if Flavorite told eDesign it was sending the printer stands as an accommodation? So if you remember back uh, about what we were saying about acceptance of an offer and how that could be done, including shipping the goods and what happens if those goods are non-conforming, that's what you want to look at for that first question. The second question, Truck Parts Inc. Um, often sells supplies to United Fix-It Company, which services trucks. Over the phone, they negotiate for the sale of 84 sets of tires. TPI sends a letter to UFC detailing the terms and two weeks later ships the tires. Is there an enforceable contract? Why or why not? So take a look at uh, some of the things we said about the um, requirement for a writing, who the parties are, whether it's sufficient to follow up a oral uh, agreement with a writing, and uh, that should help you there. Then the last question has multiple parts. When will risk of loss pass from the seller to the buyer under each of the following contracts, assuming the parties have not expressly agreed on when risk of loss could pass? So it's not in the contract when risk of loss to pass. What are the UCC rules? And you're going to need to dig into the chapter and take a look at some of these uh, shipping terms. Uh, it says a New York seller contracts with a San Francisco buyer to ship goods to the buyer, FOB San Francisco. So that's free on board, and you're going to need to look in the uh, chapter, find out what that means and what that would mean in terms of the risk of loss. And um, all of these relate to risk of loss. The next one says FOB New York or FOB San Francisco. Uh, the third one, a seller contracts with the buyer to sell goods located on the seller's premises. The buyer pays for the goods and arranges to pick them up the next week at the seller's place of business. So when does risk of loss pass there? And then the last one, a seller contracts with the buyer to sell goods located in a warehouse. So in this case, we're talking about um, a bailey or a, a situation where the goods are somewhere beside the seller's place of business and potentially have some issues around delivery of the goods without them actually moving. So if you look at those concepts we talked about when we reviewed the chapter, you should be in pretty good shape and look forward to seeing you on Thursday.